All right, I have a lot of questions to answer, so I'm gonna jump right into it. Okay, so I haven't been getting out and doing a lot of plein air painting, and there's two reasons for that. Number one is there was a lot of, there was a lot of smoke in the area, uh, and then the other thing is I have a big show coming up uh, the beginning of October at Studio Gallery in San Francisco, so this last month is kind of crunch time. I'm gonna try to post as much as possible here on YouTube, but it may slow down a little bit. Um, hopefully get out at least once a week to do some plein air. Um, I am doing sort of studio visits and stuff on my Patreon channel. I'll be posting regular little videos, you know, showing the progress of my show. Uh, Patreon link in description. That also helps support the channel, keeps me, keeps me making these videos. But anyway, let me jump into these questions. Can you talk about shooting reference photos? So usually what I do is I will tend to shoot a photograph sort of large. So in other words, I don't go for a final crop when I'm taking the photograph. Uh, if I see a scene that kind of grabs me or if there's something about it that I like, which is usually, again, a light shadow pattern, or maybe it's a scene that I like and I'm not quite sure how to compose it, um, I'll shoot kind of large uh, and then I'll put it up on my computer and I'll play around with the image, crop it in various different um, aspect ratios. And oftentimes I will live with those photographs for like, I mean, there's times when I've had a photograph that I've continued to crop and experiment with for 10 years. And then finally the moment hits where it's like, okay, it's, yeah, you know, like I'm ready to go for it on this. Um, so that's kind of the process, like shoot large. Uh, and that's really it. As far as this person also wanted to know, like the quality of the photographs. I just use my iPhone now and I used to carry around a little um, power shot, Canon power shot which didn't even have near the resolution that, you know, that a modern day smartphone has. Smartphones today, the, the, it's, the quality is, is totally good enough. In fact, sometimes like, I feel like a grainy photograph is often easier to paint from because it's sort of, um, the detail's not as obvious and it kind of breaks things down into simple shapes. Uh, so that can be beneficial for a painter. Uh, so I don't mind, like I don't, need really high quality um, photographs. Uh, so um, another thing I'll say about that, sometimes I'll shoot large and then I'll, you know, kind of blow up one tiny section of the, uh, you know, of the, of the image. Something that I maybe didn't notice when I was on scene, when I was shooting photographs. Then when I'm looking on the computer, I'm like, oh wow, there's this little scene down here is, could be a, make a good painting and I'll zoom in on it. But then of course the quality is reduced. It's kind of grainy. And, um, and I actually like painting from those too. It kind of, like I said, it, it simplifies the scene for you in a way. Uh, what else can I say? So you don't need a quality, yeah, camera, smartphones are totally good enough. Um, and then what else, painting from ref reference photos. I don't tend to tweak the color too much. Um, if, if it's too cool, like if it's leaning too blue, sometimes I will, you know, sometimes I'll boost up the contrast uh, especially on dusk scenes, oftentimes my camera will compensate and make things too light. Um, and I know that I have to kind of darken, you know, boost the contrast in order to get, you know, like street lights and that sort of thing to, to really pop. So I just kind of play around with it in, you know, my photo app on my computer or my laptop. Is it even called an app on a laptop? I think it's like your, whatever the photo program is, I don't know. Uh, okay. So hopefully I covered that. Um, uh, let's see, how do you keep your whites so clean? And I think this person was referring to the still lifes I do of like say fruit where the background is pure white. Um, what I'll do when I come in and do those lights is I will use a separate brush um, and one, and then I'll squeeze out a new pile of clean white paint and I might tint it slightly. I always tint it slightly, usually with some like yellow or even maybe a little bit of permanent rose. Those colors like pink or like a warm yellow um, tend to create a light, you know, like a bright um, luminous effect when you're using white. Um, occasionally I will even use purple too, depending on what the subject matter is. Um, just a slight tint of that. And then I just load the brush, add a little medium, put a stroke on, and then keep repeating that process and that usually works, you know, just squeezing out clean white paint, 
mixing in, even on the palette knife, just kind of getting it, getting a pile of paint that's clean with that slight tint in there, and then using a, a clean brush, one that's dry. Um, that really seems to help. Now, as far as like when I'm doing skies, I notice that you need to get a really light value for the sky. And oftentimes when I go to paint in the sky, I will notice that even the mineral spirits that I'm using, because it tends to be dirty if I'm thinning with mineral spirits, even that dirty mineral spirits will, will kind of gray down the, the luminance, uh, is that a word? Yeah, I guess so. Um, the luminous effect of the sky, you know, it'll make it look kind of gray or dull. So when I'm doing skies, what I've been doing lately, and I'm gonna post a video about, I think I, yeah, I've got a video coming up where I'll, I'll talk about this, where what I'll do is I will, you know, do a stain, like say I have yellow on the sky, or I'll do a wash, wipe it off, and then come over it with white paint. That white paint will pick up a little bit of that underpainting or that wash, um, that seems to be get a way to get a really clean radiant sky um, and keep your lights uh, clean. So, uh, but more on that later. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so yeah, clean brush and squeeze out some fresh white paint. All right, can you talk about the surfaces you like to paint on? So lately, as you guys probably know, my favorite surface to paint on is my, uh, I like painting on panels that I've treated, that I've done myself, and I use, you know, uh, masonite. And what I'll do is put three coats of gesso on there, and and the third coat of gesso has some pumice, four F grade pumice, which is very fine volcanic powder. Uh, you could use marble dust too, I've heard, although I've never tried it, so I can't speak about how I feel about that. Um, I use two tablespoons of four F pumice mixed into one cup of um, gesso and then I'll thin it with water uh, until it's thin enough to brush on. When you put the pumice in it does kind of thicken it up a little bit um, but I still will thin it to the point where I can actually use a roller and then I brush out the roller stro uh, the roller stipple or whatever. That uh, really works for me because the, um, the, the gessoed surface with the, that bit of pumice in it it gives it some absorbency, which really helps when you're just like kind of scrubbing in, like thinning with odorless mineral spirits and just scrubbing in your basic colors, which is how I paint when I paint on canvas. And that's the traditional way of doing, say, plein air paintings, is you're gonna scrub in approximate colors, just thinning with either turpentine or with odorless mineral spirits. Um, but the problem is you break down the binder, you're breaking down and thinning the oils that are in the paint, which hold the pigments, uh, the, the pigment particles together. So unless that is soaking into your surface, if it's sitting on the top of the surface, you can literally just scrape it off. So like typical gesso is just like plastic. It's shiny. If you thin your paint with odorless mineral spirits and you put that on there, you can just even when it's dry, you can just scratch, scratch it off with your fingernail, and that's not good. So adding that bit of absorbency to your gesso, I think, is key. It's a much nicer uh, surface to paint on. Having said that, um, I do also like painting on canvas. Ironically, my favorite surface to paint on is um, for canvas is, I think it's called Blick Studio. They're inexpensive canvases. They're not, you know, they're for like, they're student grade. So it's only like seven ounce or whatever. But I just love the effects I get with those canvases. So it's like if I get their Premier, which is expensive, it's, it just is harder to cover. It just seems like I'm fighting that canvas the whole time. Unless they use a medium like Liquin, but I don't want to use that in the studio. So. If I'm painting outdoors and I thin with liquid, I can use their Premier. But when I'm painting in the studio, I use their inexpensive canvases and I don't care. I feel like there are painters like Jamie Wyatt who paint on cardboard or even um, uh, Nikolai Fashion. He used to paint on cardboard too or Toulouse-Lautrec cardboard. So I'm not like worried about it. If I can only get that effect on those canvases, somebody later could take it off the stretcher bars and mount it on a board if it's worth saving 200 years from now or whatever. That's not my problem. I'm just trying to get the effect that I'm after. And so if I use those Blick uh, Studios, um, yeah, I just like the way paint goes on. So, um, all right, so those are basically the canvases I use, like Blick Studio, and, um, and then my homemade panels. The homemade panels are really nice though because they're archival, they're inexpensive, 
And let's see, the largest size I've made has been 16 by 20, I think. Um, no, I've made like, I've made 16 by 24s, which is like, yeah, that's like a two by three ratio. But I'm considering doing some 36 by 36s, in which case I'd have to build a frame to support the masonite because it's kind of wobbly. But anyway, more on that later. Uh, let's see here. So those are the surfaces I paint on. How do you film yourself walking and talking? Uh, I don't have a camera because I'm filming right now, but I have a tripod that I use um, and then the camera mounts on here. I have two of the tripods, obviously, because um, I'm using one now. But I'll mount my camera and it's got a flip up screen. It's a Canon G7X and the flip up screen allows me to frame the shot. But I simply hold it out like a selfie stick and I'm walking along. Something about having it um, extended out there, it kind of, the camera has stabilization. But for some reason, having that camera out there on this selfie stick, it stabilizes, uh, stabilizes the camera really nicely. Uh, but then also I can use this to set up what are called locked off shots where your tripod is set and I'm like, say, filming the ocean or I'm filming myself painting. Um, so this with my G7X mounted on it is all I need to go out in the field and make the videos that you see here on YouTube. Uh, and it did take some thought to really streamline it because obviously I have my painting equipment too. So I need a very, very lightweight, simple to set up, simple to film um, sort of camera setup and this works for me. Uh, so the Canon G7X is the camera and then this, I don't know, this is a slick and to be honest with you, it's covered with paint. I don't even remember the model, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a slick um, tripod. It's about $119. So that's the scoop on that. And let's see. But any tripod at work, really. And, you know, whatever works for you. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, will you ever, ever make merch? Um, like merchandise, like sweatshirts and stuff like that. I think it could be fun to have a blue hoodie since that's all I wear. <laughs> My own specific Chamby paints or Chamberlain paintings um blue hoodie uh so yeah maybe someday it would be it could be kind of fun to do that nothing in the immediate future for that uh just because i got so much else going on and i'd want to make sure that they were high quality and even though my daughter who's a youtuber she's got a bunch of merch maybe i can tag on to her to, hey just you guys make an extra make me a sweatshirt and then i'll sell it on my youtube or whatever anyway so if, if i get that together i'll let you guys know for sure uh, can you talk about the mediums you use? Um, there seems to be a lot of questions about mediums. I use two different types of mediums. When I'm outdoors, I will use Liquin, as you guys know. Liquin's a fast drying medium. Windsor & Newton makes it. Um, and it, you know, the paintings tend to dry overnight when you use that. I like it because it, it, you can break down the paint to the point where you really can cover your panel quickly. Um, but also you're adding binder to the pigments. So it's when you mix with liquid and you paint it on there, even if you thin it way down to the point of a glaze, even it's, that's going to be, it's a really strong binder and it's going to really, um, uh, adhere to your panel. So it's, so liquid is a combination of being able to apply paint super quickly. Um, and then number two, having a really powerful binder. So, uh, and then drying overnight is kind of a nice feature too. If you're traveling, if I'm doing plein air, like traveling and stuff, the paintings are dry the next day, so it's easier to manage them. Uh, so I use liquid outdoors. I do not use it indoors except under extreme conditions because it smells so toxic and it'll give me a headache. But I will open the windows and have an exhaust fan and another fan blowing on me if I need to do touch-ups indoors for some reason, like in the winter. But often what I'll do, like when I'm touching up for a show, like right now, is I'll just set up outdoors on my, on my driveway because I'm not using a computer for reference. I'm just looking at the painting and doing necessary touch-ups to clean up the painting. Um, and I don't need to look at the source. And when I do plein air painting, I don't take photographs of what I'm painting anyway. So what I end up doing is I just end up doing touch-ups from, you know, just looking at the painting and decide what does this thing need just to clean it up and get it ready to go out the door or to go to a show or whatever, or to show to people. Um, so that's liquid outdoors. Indoors, uh, I will use um, a mixture of one part odorless mineral spirits, one part stand oil, and, one, and two parts linseed oil. And then I mix that up and I keep it in a little jar, which 
I keep on the counter over here. Um, and that is, you know, cause it's linseed oil based and some odorless mineral spirits in there, not really toxic at all. I mean, I suppose there's some evaporation from the mineral spirits, but I got a fan going, whatever. I don't, there's no, and then linseed oil is a vegetable oil basically. So it's not toxic at all. I use that indoors. That does allow you to put the paint on um, as well. Like it, it makes the paint flow and it allow you to get some blended edges as well. But the thing I'd say about mediums is just experiment with them. Um, and then it's it, like people have asked, how much do I mix in? It's different every time, every time I mix up a pile of paint, depending what I'm trying to do. Like if I'm trying to do the cover the panel quickly, I will mix in a lot of say liquid um, to get that to happen. I'll like, and then as I, and then I start using less and less as I approach the ending of the painting, because I don't want to thin the paint too much. I want to have thicker, uh, thicker paint, particularly the lights. I want the lights to be thicker and thicker. Like when I'm doing like say a dusk scene, those last bits of light could be oftentimes would be like straight yellow right out of like cadmium yellow medium or cadmium yellow light straight out of the tube. No medium, no nothing. Just paint, put it on there, paint out of the tube onto the panel. Uh, but what I'd say is like, you've got to just experiment and, and, um, you know, even if you just like put up a panel to experiment with, just mix some colors, see how it works, see what kind of effects you can get. Just play around with it. That's what I did. Um, so I would recommend that because everybody's going to have different taste. Like what works for me may not work for you. Uh, let's see. Can you make a video, uh, covering the basics for someone who's never painted before, like ultra beginner? Uh, yeah, I would be up for that. It'd be really helpful if you guys, like if you're a beginner, if you could put um, a question, like put some questions down in the comments section and let me know what it is you'd like me to talk about. Um, I have made videos where I've talked about, you know, like what you need to get started um, with plein air and I'll put a link up here or here. <laughs> I can never remember which side the link shows up on, but I'll put a link to that video. Um, and yeah, but let me know what you'd like to, for me to cover in that. I'd be happy to try to put that together. Uh, cause I do realize when you're first starting out, it can be kind of intimidating and overwhelming. Uh, just, you know, there's so many materials and you know, like what sort of paintings should you experiment with in the beginning? So let me know what you want and I'll see if I can make a video about that. Uh, oh, surfing question. Do you surf most days? I surf last week. I surfed four days out of the week. Um, I'm getting to the point where my stamina is such that I could surf every, mm, if I surf every day in the week, if like, like typically I take weekends off cause it just gets so crowded. Um, so I'll surf like four or five days a week. When I first started, I couldn't do that. Like I would surf for a couple hours and I'd be pretty much a zombie for the rest of the day. Now I'm to the point where I can surf an hour and a half or two and then come back and fully work all day. And it's just a great way to start my morning. I'm typically out there at 6.30 to 7.30 and then I'll stay in until like say 9.30 or something like that or you know nine. And uh, then I come back and just get started you know, working. Um, typically in the morning it's cool. So like if I'm outdoors and it's summertime, then I'll start working on frames, like sanding frames and doing whatever work I need to do outdoors before it gets fully sunny. Uh, then around noon, I'll, you know, have something to eat and come and start painting. So that's kind of the program, but yeah, I try to surf every day. Keeps me, um, keeps me healthy and energized and positive. Uh, let's see. Okay. How do you decide what to edit out of a scene? Uh, so this is interesting. Um, all right. So when I'm going to do a painting, let's, let's take say a cityscape first and then we'll talk about plein air. So when I'm doing cityscapes, um, oftentimes it's determined by the size of the panel. So if I'm doing like a 36 by 36 cityscape, I'm going to leave in more detail. Uh, now if something is blocking, um, a key feature, like for example, if I'm doing a cityscape and there's a view out to the bay and I've got the Bay Bridge or something, if there's a building that's sort of obscuring, um, you know, a key feature like the bridge or whatever, I may eliminate it or lower it or make a change like that. Or if there's like a, um, a lot of times, uh, like say there might be a sign or some sort of lamp post or some sort of thing. I, I always make my choices, um, compositionally. In other words, if there's something that's going to block a key feature 
or it's going to obstruct the sort of flow of the, uh, how should we say, or if it just like stands out as being awkward or um, creating a tension that I don't want, then I'll eliminate it. Uh, so that's the deal with a big one. Like I will leave most of the detail in. And, um, but then when it's a smaller cityscape, a lot of times things like lamp posts or auto, like cars or some f other features, they can just be too fussy where I couldn't, like I'd have to paint them with a tiny brush. Oftentimes I'll leave those out and simplify the scene and focus on what's really, what really attracts me to that scene. Usually which is a strong shadow, uh, like light and light and dark pattern. So when I'm doing plein air and I'm painting landscapes, that's a different sort of situation because uh, rarely will I find a perfect composition out there and I tend to maybe have something off to the left that I really like and maybe something in the foreground, something off to, to the right and I kind of bring those elements together and create an interesting composition. So a lot of my plein air paintings, if you watch these videos, you know that to me I view it almost as an abstract painting. I will start with an idea and then I will use the visual information as raw materials to create an interesting painting. Um, that I feel like oftentimes really does capture the feel of the scene, even though it's not exact. You know, it's not it's not like a literal transla the translation. I don't do that ever, I don't think. I'm always moving things around to create an interesting painting. Because ultimately I'm not trying to, you know, do a portrait of a particular place. Although I want to capture the essence of the place, but the key thing is that I want a good painting. It's got to be a good painting. And um, so, yeah, so the editing process is all about that. And that's something that just comes with experience. You know, I've thought about making videos here on YouTube where I talk about composition and I've done that where I kind of explain why I want to eliminate certain things or how I want to move certain things around or whatever. And I'll continue to do that, but there's really no substitute for you spending that time experimenting and moving things around and really thinking about your compositions you just because you're going to develop your own sense of composition and um and in a lot of ways like i wouldn't want to like i have my own taste and my own feel um that's just developed through doing hundreds of paintings and um so that's really what you got to do is just jump into that process experiment moving things around and figuring out what works for you Anyway, that's it for these questions. Um, like I said, I'm going to be really focusing a lot on my show. I'm going to try to post here as much as possible, but it, I may slow down a little bit. Like I said, there'll be additional videos on my Patreon channel, link down below. As usual, thanks for hanging out, guys. Stay creative, uh, and I'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.